read from uh, God's Word just a couple verses in Ephesians, and the Apostle Paul prays this about the church. Um, he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in the inner man through his Spirit, and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through their faith. Um, I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and the width and the height and depth of God's love, and to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do more um, above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ to all generations forever. Amen. Let's keep worshiping. to you this morning. Speak to us through your word. 
Lord, help us experience you, and we want to know you better, Lord, and um, we ask that uh, you would bless this service, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys can be seated. Amen. Kids, you guys can be dismissed to your classroom. All right, today we're going to be in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. 16, yes. All right, so the last few weeks we've been going over a series called Space, um, and we define space as this, as room for a better life. And we talked about creating space with our finances. We talked about creating space with our time. And this week, I want to talk about creating space, it, creating moral space. All right, and it, it might be like a little bit, little bit, a little bit of a surprise, a little bit different than the last few sermons that we've that we've uh, that we've had. But most, the reason we've been going through this series is because most of us live our lives at the limits. Right? We live our lives at the limits, of our, uh, the, the limits of our time, our money, our emotions, and our energy. And it's the way our culture is today. And it's no different when it comes to morality and things that we do that are right and wrong, with temptation. Just like our time and money, et most everyone lives at the very edges of what we call right and wrong. We oftentimes ask ourselves, how close can I get to that line? Right? Have you ever heard... I, 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 I'm the youth pastor here, teenagers, like, how, how, what's, what's too far? What's, how far can I get before it's breaking the rules, Chris? <laughs> and we leave no space at all. Then when temptation comes our way, we wonder why we fail. And why we fail so easily. So I want to read the passage to you today that we're going to be in. Um, if you can turn, if you have your Bibles turned there, it's James chapter 1. Um, I'm going to read it here. It says this. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it, be, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Verse 16 says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. My first point that I want to make today is this, that everyone is tempted. Everyone is tempted. How we respond is important and it shows a great deal about our faith. Everyone is tempted. If you're in here this morning and you're breathing, the pa this passage applies to you. All right, so no one can, go, no, no one can be in here and say, oh, I, I, I'm good, Chris. That's good. This passage applies to you. This sermon is for you. No one in here should be pointing fingers. That means no one in here should be pointing fingers at anyone else saying, yeah, I've got that covered. That, that. He's the one that needs to hear that. She's the one that needs to hear that. I want you guys to, as we're listening today, as, you're, as, you're, as we're reading uh, the scripture, I want you guys to, to, to look into your own lives. No pointing fingers, okay, guys? Everyone is tempted. This is, a common, this is common to all mankind. It says in 1 Corinthians that there is no temptation that is not common to man. You're not the only one that's going through that, whatever it is that, that, it, that affects you. You're not the only one that's going through that. This is a battle that everyone fights. What looks different, though, is this. What looks different is the way that we respond to it, especially when we fail. Our natural responses to, to, to failing to temptation is what? Blame. Blame. Right? It's blame. And a lot of times, we don't even know it. We do it without, without speaking the words. It's God's fault. But we blame God. And how do we do that? We blame others. We blame circumstances. We blame the situations that we're in. And by default, by default, that's saying God allowed those circumstances. God allowed those situations. So God allowed me to face that temptation, and therefore, it must be his fault, Right? Why do we shift the blame? Why do we shift blame? You saw that you, you see that in in, uh, in the story of Adam and Eve, where as soon as God God finds them after they they disobeyed Him, Adam blame, shifts the blame to, to Eve, and Eve shifts the blame to, to the serpent. No one takes responsibility for it. Why do we shift the blame? Because, because we don't want to have to clean up the mess. That's really it, isn't it? We don't, have to, we don't have to be responsible for the mess that it makes. 
This is our natural tendency. The one thing that we have a hard time doing is taking responsibility. And the part of taking responsibility is doing the hard work of cleaning up our own mess. Learning what we did wrong, learning what we did wrong, and learning about what it was that put us in that compromising position, and learning how to fight those lures and that lust. We don't want to have to do that hard work, so we shift the blame. That's not our fault. That means I don't have to change the way I do anything. How we respond to failure in temptation, oh, sorry, how we re respond to failure in temptation, it matters. We can blame or we can take responsibility and clean up the mess and learn more about strengthening our defenses and creating that space that we need. And that leads me to my next point. So my point two is this. If you're taking notes, it says, hey, it's everyone is tempted. That's what we got in the first point. Everyone is tempted, but we're all tempted by, everyone is tempted by his or her own personal desires. It becomes very personal. It's, it's specific to you. It's different for everyone. It looks different for everyone. All right, I want to read verse 14 again. I want to go back to verse 14. It says this, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away. I want to stop. But each person is tempted. It doesn't say if you're tempted. You might, it might, you might happen to stumble across temptation. It says when each person is tempted, you're going to be tempted. It, 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 it's something that's going to happen. You have to be prepared for it. When each person is tempted and dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. I want to break down this verse a little bit. I want to go back to the original language that it was written in. Because I think it can help us understand more about what God's trying to tell us through it. All right? So if we go to that word, um, dragged away. It might look different in your, in your, uh, in your Bibles. It might, if you're, depending on the translation here, it might say Lord, Lord, Lord. Lord, 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 yeah. That word in Greek, in the original language, before it's translated, is this word, excelko. Excelko. Sorry, there's a, there's a thing on the O. Excelko, right? It's a hunting term. Do I have any hunters and fishers in the building? Anybody? Yeah, I, I know, I know. Yeah? All right. It's a hunting term that, emphasis, that has emphasis on being lured away from one's safe cover. It's to draw out of safety. That's literally what it means. To draw out of safety. In hunting and fishing, as, as game is lured from its hiding place. That's what that word means. There's another word in that verse that I want to look at, and it's the word dele... I, I, I was trying to figure out how to pronounce these this week. Deleazo. Okay, dele, can you guys say that with Deleazo. It's, it's pretty easy, right? Deleazo. That's the word that it, that's... In the verse, if you read it, that enticed. Deleazo. That's another fishing term, and it has emphasis on be and on deception. If you read the definition, its, em it's emphasis is on deception, and I'm going to read it here. It says, um, fishing term that has emphasis on deception to beguile by blandishment, to allure, to entice, to deceive. All right? To use bait in order to catch. So now, having, uh, having a little bit more understanding of those words, I want to reread that verse. It says this, But each person, when it's temp when, when e oh, each person is tempted when they are dragged away out of safety, when they are taken away from their safety, when they're lured out of their safety by their own evil desire and deceived, enticed, baited, Now, now, if we look at the verse, we're baited and hooked by what? There's that word in there, by our own evil desire, right? By our own evil desire. Just, not just any desire. The Bible doesn't say, you're lured and enticed by desire. It says, by your own desire. It's specific to you. Our desire, our craving, our lo whatever it is that we long for. We desire for what's forbidden to us what we lust after. That's what that word actually is. 
that can also be translated. You might have a different translation, might actually say lust. Who here has ever been who here has ever been on like a diet? <laughs> Obviously, they don't have too much experience, but they, we. <laughs> who here has ever been on a diet and, and maybe lied to themselves about trying, or lied to themselves about trying to be on a diet? And, and each person has different things that they're tempted by, right? And who, who here is tempted by like chocolate cake? <laughs> Not many. I don't care about cake. <laughs> yeah, some of us are, right? It's different for every person. You know what mine is. You guys might have like sweets or like, you know, those things that you have. Bacon. <laughs> Bacon or, or cheeseburgers. That's like what I, that's like the stuff that, that can like tear me away. Or you know what's even better than that? Bacon cheeseburgers. You got it. <laughs> the point is this, the point is this. Some bait is more appealing to you and some is more appealing to me. But the bait is put there by our enemy. The bait is put there by our enemy in, in, in order to lure you into a trap, drag you away from safety to deceive you. And the result of being tricked by that bait is sin. It's doing that thing that you promised yourself you wouldn't do. Doing that thing that you know you shouldn't do. Falling short of the mark that you might have set for yourself. Going past the boundaries that God has lovingly placed for our benefit. It's not an accident or by chance that these things are, are, are right in front of you every day. It's not an accident that temptation is literally everywhere. It's not an accident that every single drama television on show, uh, television show on, I just said television, <coughs> every single drama on TV, that's better. <laughs> is seemingly aiming to normalize cheating husbands, right? Cheating wives. It's not an accident that teenage dramas want to normalize pros promiscuity. It's not, it's not an accident. It's not an accident that this world outside of Christianity, and maybe even sometimes inside of it, has embraced sex before marriage as the cultural norm. It's not an accident that you can't read an article on the internet without seeing like six or seven links on the side that are like completely inappropriate, that all you have to do is just click on it. It's not an accident that the style and the fashions of the world want women to show all that all all the all that God has given them in form. So much so that you can't really walk down the street without like just looking straight down. It's not an accident. It's a carefully planned trap. It's a deception. And what happens when that war works? What happens when that deception works? When you're dragged out of safety? The Bible calls it sin. My, my third point, sin. It's moral fault. It's moral fault. That's, that's what sin is. Is the result of a process that begins at temptation. It's a result of a process. A lot of times we think sin is just, it, it happens. It's a random, like, oh man, I, I, I just... Oh man, I can't believe I messed up. But we don't realize that there was an actual, there was, a, there was a process that brought us to that point. Sin doesn't just happen all of a sudden. It's not just a singular act in and of itself. Sin is the result of a process. I want to read verse 15 to you guys, so follow along with me on the screen or in your Bibles. It says this, Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. It, it, the writer here moves from, uh, from hunting analogies and hunting, hunting language to, to something that we all know is a very long process, right? Pregnancy. He, he, does, he has that imagery in his words. He says, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. One Bible teacher that I really, really enjoy his, uh, reading and, and listening to, he speaks about this verse, and he explains this process better than I could have ever explained it, so I kind of study it. Um, this is how he breaks it down, and I want to share this with you guys today. It says this, this, the first step in the process of sin is this. Sweet. It's desire. 
The first, process is, the first step in the process is desire. And this has to do with our emotions, okay? It's a feeling, it's, want, it's a wanting. It begs, it's a wanting that begs to be satisfied. This is what we talked about in verse 14, that, that specific desire to, your, to yourself. This, this is a part of us that is the lure that the bait speaks to. Sorry, the lure that, or bait that's, that speaks to our desires. It, it's kind of that smell, that scent that makes your mouth water, right? That's what this desire is. It's an emotion. It speaks to our emotions. The second step, after the desire part, is deception. And this part happens inside of our minds. It's no longer, it stops becoming an emotional thing. It starts becoming something that we rationalize. Okay? When we begin to justify or rationalize the thing that once was an emotion. It was that, that sweet smell. Now I'm starting to think, like, I just had one cheeseburger, it's okay. <laughs> right? I start to rationalize it. I start to, I start to, uh, I start to, to kind of justify why it would be okay to do this, or why it's not wrong. A lot of times we say that, that's not wrong, right? It's not wrong if I just get stuck a little closer to that line. It's no longer a feeling. We've begun to convince ourselves. We actually convince ourselves that it's our right, or that it's the way things ought to be, or that it's not wrong. And you see this a lot in, in uh, unfaithful relationships. Well, it's not, it's not wrong to flirt a little bit, is it? No, it's not at all. It's okay to open up emotionally to him or to her. She's my friend. He's my friend. It's not going to hurt anybody. Right? It's not going to hurt anybody. It's, okay. it's not wrong, so therefore it's not sin. So we start to rationalize. We actually start to justify these steps that we're taking. Step three is this. Design Sorry, it's it, design is the third step. And that has to do with our will. That's actually taking tangible steps, trying to plot things out. We start the plan, we start the plan begins to form in our minds. You guys you guys know what I'm talking about, right? I'm not alone on this one. It goes from rationalization, which makes it not wrong, to figuring out how can I put myself in more of these not wrong situations. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's design. That's will. That's when we start to actually will it into being. And then the fourth step, we all know, is the end. It's, it's the action. It's sin. The act, the end result, spiritual death. So now that you know the process, so now that you know the process of what happens on your way to sin, on your way to messing up, or doing that thing you promised yourself you wouldn't do, promised God you wouldn't do. Your job is this. It's taking that responsibility that we talked about earlier and to be very brutally honest with yourself. Like brutally honest. I'm talking about like you're afraid to talk to people about it honest. Being honest with yourself is the only way to be. And plug in your specific sin, the sin that you're messing up with, the, the thing that, that gets you the most, plugging it into step four, and then working backwards through it and saying, what are the steps that I took to get here? What are all the each specific things that happened on my way in the process to that end result, that sin? And that, so that's our job. Now that you know the process, you can't claim ignorance anymore. Sorry. I promise you that if, you, if you're honest with yourself, and, I, and, and like I said, brutally honest, then, you, then you've ha helped yourself in that particular battle immediately, if you be honest with yourself. I mean, you just upgraded your, your, like, your fighting weapons from a pea shooter to, to like a, a rocket launcher. That's really what, what you just did. But that's not, just knowing it isn't enough. You have to actually take the steps to change it. But, and so, taking the steps to change it, right? Where can we create that space? It still leaves us with a question. Where in the process do we begin to deal with the sin in our lives? Where in that process, in the four-step process, is it? At what point in the timeline is it best, is the best place to kill the process? Where do we need to create space? 
I want to just read the next verse. The next verse says this, do not be deceived. Brothers and sisters, do not be deceived. Literally what the writer says. As you can see, that's one of our steps in our process. Deception of mind. You, you, the one thing I want to point out is, is that that enticement, that lure, that bait, is going to be there. That's not something, you can't just, you can't seclude yourself from everyone else in a forest and not be around anybody. I mean, you can do that, but it's still going to affect you. That's what I'm trying to say. You can't expect to do that and win that battle. That's not where you're going to create space. Staying as far away from it as possible, yeah, that's a good, it's a definitely good idea. It's definitely a good idea to, to take steps away from it so that it's not directly in front of you. But even when you do that, you're still going to be enticed by something. If it's not that thing that you took away, steps away from, it's something else. There's a plan to lure you, to put bait right in front of you. So where do we fight it? Where do we create that space? It's in the deception. It's in our minds. Point, point number four says that it's creating moral space is done by knowing the truth. So that we can't be deceived. Does that make sense? Understanding reality and not allowing ourselves to be deceived by the tricks and lies of Satan, who's out to devour and kill us, that's how we can create moral space. I'll give you a real life tangible example of something that we as a society have been deceived by. Okay? I want to give that to you today. I want to just go through this one, this one particular sin that we go through. And I want to prep you guys because a lot of people have a lot of different, very, like, you know, views on this one particular sin. And it's it's, it's so hard because if we don't have a right relationship with God, if you don't have a right, right relationship with God, it's almost like nonsense. But I'm going to try to logically lay it out for you so you can understand well, how the world deceives us in this way. You guys ready? You guys ready? I prepped you. Sex. The world says it's absolutely stupid for you to get married without having had sex first. With other people or with the person that you're married. <coughs> the world says it's normal for two people who are in a relationship with each other, who are unmarried, to have sex. That's the norm. You know what else is the norm in this world? If, we, if we're just going by normals of this world, you know what else is the norm? <coughs> Divorce. Bitterness inside of marriage. Husbands and wives who are still together, but they're barely hanging on. That's the normal. Unf unfaithfulness in those marriages that are hanging on. Unfaithfulness in any marriage. Sorry. Unfaithfulness in any relationship. <laughs> Our enemy has plotted to convince us that cheating and divorce are so acceptable that we never stop to think. We never stop to think. That maybe, that maybe the way we handle our sexual relationships early on actually has a negative effect on them later on in life, later on down the road. We never stop to think that. But it's a possibility, isn't it? If the norm of this world is to, to not hold sex as, as sacred to marriage, but the norm of the world is also that relationships are broken constantly, and the divorce rate, the divorce rate is rising. The divorce rate is rising. That could have that could have a direct effect. Correct? Am I right? Am I wrong? No, that's impossible. That's what that's what everyone. No, that you can't. That that that, that can't be. That's so illogical. That's what they say. It's, it's so illogical that you shouldn't even be thinking about that. It makes no sense. Even smart people, even smart people who think they have such a, su such a big grasp on the world and reality, great understanding of, of how the world works, they think sex is just sex. It's not a moral issue at all. 
It's a biological thing, right? We've all heard that. We're animals that have sex drives, just like other animals. How stupid is it to say something like that? How stupid is it to say something like that, especially knowing how much trauma sex can have on a rape victim? It's stupid to say that, right? How much trauma it can have on someone who was abused growing up? How can you say that this aspect of life doesn't have an effect on the deepest parts of our souls? That's logical. That's getting through the deception, that's getting through the deception and understanding what is reality, what's, what, what really happens. Do you, you don't, how many times I've heard from a coworker or, or an acquaintance or someone who's, who's made a habit of giving into the desires without a second thought. How many times I've heard this, these words, that if you don't have sex before you're married, then you're crazy. You're crazy. I've, heard, I've actually heard those exact words from a coworker who I, I told him, like, hey, I'm waiting until marriage. And he told me, oh, you're crazy. That's, that's insane. And we had a good talk about it. And he accepted my, like, he, we, we respected our, each other's points of views. But he told me I was crazy. You know what? If crazy means that I'm, go that I'm going in the opposite direction than the norm of this day, if that's what crazy means, then sign me up for crazy. Right? <laughs> then we have the people that come to church who know a little bit about God and His forgiveness, and they say, well, well Chris, doesn't God always forgive? Aren't we always saved by grace? What you're saying now, isn't that legalism? Legalistic? I want to read 1 Corinthians 6, 12 to you. Just so you can tell everyone here knows, the word legalistic just means that you're, you're so bent on the rules that you forget the reason the rules are there. And you just follow the rules. And you create more rules and more rules and more rules. And then your, your, your God becomes those rules. That's what legalism is. Isn't that legalistic? Let's read 1 Corinthians 6, 12. It's not on there. I'm going to read it to you guys. Paul writes this. I have the right to do anything. It's in quotes. People say this. You say, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial, is it? I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. If, if this is something that you struggle with, and this is just one of the many temptations that are out there, if this is something you struggle with about the truth of this, I, I, I want to beg you, read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12. I'm not going to read the whole passage here today, but it, it's, it's a really, really insightful passage about that particular temptation. God might forgive it, but that doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it smart. That doesn't make it free of consequences or punishment. God might forgive it, but that doesn't mean it's not going to hurt the people that you influence. And, lead, and the people that you influence and that you lead to the point that they may, they may not actually, they may choose to not follow Jesus. Because of it. Here's the point I'm trying to make, and this is, where, this is where I want to close today. This subject matter is only one of many temptations that we who are, are in here face on a day to day. It's just one of the many that we deceive ourselves about, that we that we that we face. That that might be those lures. It might not even be your lure. I could have talked about I could have talked about things like stealing. I could have uh, talked about lying. I could have talked about the temptation to gossip. But no matter what, no matter what it is that lures you or that baits you, Understanding the truth, understanding and figuring out what reality is about that, and surrounding ourselves with that truth, that's how we stop the process. That's how we create space in that process of sin. If we're fighting against deception and half-truths, then, then we have to have full understanding of God's Word. If we're fighting against, that's, that's what we're fighting against, deception, and half-truths, which are basically lies, then we have to have full understanding of God's Word, the truth. We have to do the work of applying it to how we live, 
allowing it to change our actions. However big or small that might be. And yeah, that takes some work. But that's how we create moral space. And I want to read you a little passage about truth. It says in John 8, 32, it says this. If you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples of mine. This is Jesus talking. And he says this. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Free of that. The truth will make you free. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for just everything that you've been doing here and through Meeting House Church and through our, our church family this summer and this year. And Lord, I just I thank you so much for for bringing us your truth through your word today. But I just pray that it, it transforms our lives, it transforms the way we live, the way we act, the way we interact with each other. And I pray that we can, we can really go home and throughout the week just, just meditate and think about the things, the truths that you've spoken into our lives today, Lord. Lord, I pray that, that, it, that it helps us to create that space that we've been desiring, that we need, that we want, so that we don't fall into temptation. Lord. But I just pray that we have a good rest of the day and that everyone has a good weekend and that you keep us safe and that we come back again next week and do it again. In Jesus name.